In the Purely Post and Beam online course, we teach a form of timber framing known as mill rule, meaning that the timbers are all consistently sized enough that we can reference the edge of the timber or the size of the timber depending on its location, but it's square. We don't have to worry about getting the timber perfectly square because it's already been planed and it's the correct size. If you're working with wood that is irregular, you might need to use a different method of timber framing. There are two other types. One is called square rule, and in the square rule method, um, you basically operate on the assumption that somewhere within your gnarled, twisted, cracked timber, there is a perfectly square piece of wood, and you just need to uncover it. At the location of your joinery, you need to create one flat surface. Once you have a perfectly flat surface, you can square off of that to the other three sides to create a square shape in the timber, where the sides are at 90 degrees relative to each other. And then you can also modify its size. So for instance, if you're working with rough sawn lumber, you might end up with a post that's eight and a quarter by eight and three eighths. But if you look at the cut sheets for the 24 by 24 frame that we cut in class, it assumes an 8 inch by 8 inch timber for the sizes of the joinery and the lengths of the joists that will frame into it and the length of the beam that frames into it. So at the location uh, on your post where you're going to cut joinery, you need to reduce that 8 and a quarter by 8 and 3 eighths timber into an 8 by 8 piece where the sides are perfectly square relative to each other, and then you can execute the joinery. The nice thing about doing that technique is that it will allow you to move like things to different locations in the building. If you create an eight by eight timber with the sides square to each other at the location of the joinery, it could exist in several different places in the building, just like the posts that we cut in the class which can live in several different places because they are all exactly to dimension and square. So once you've chosen a spot on the timber where the joinery is gonna take place and you've reduced it to eight inches by eight inches, for instance, in the case of a post, and the four sides are square to each other, you then need to start thinking about locations of other joinery that's going to take place on the post. You need to transfer the surface that you've just created to other locations on the post. And there are a couple of different ways to do it. One would be to use a level um, to transfer the flat plane vertically on the post. The other thing would be to use a chalk line to snap a line along the entire face of the post and then use that chalk line as your reference. So if you're talking about a post that lives on the outside of the building, your reference would be the outside face of that post. So if your post is eight and a quarter inches projecting into the space, you would wanna measure eight inches from the back side of the post out to the front and reduce the post to eight inches measuring off of the back. If the post is in the middle of the building, then your heiress or reference becomes the center line of the post. So everything would be measured off of the center line and out to create an eight inch by eight inch timber. The other timber framing method is known as scribe rule, and it's the oldest of all three. And it was developed because there was a time when we didn't have sawn lumber and certainly didn't have plain lumber. So every piece that went into a timber frame was different in terms of size and shape and warp and twist. The scribe rule method basically involves scribing one piece to another to make a custom fit. In the scribe rule method, each place has one unique location in the timber frame because you have irregular pieces coming together and joining. So you can't take a piece from location A and move it to location B because it will have very differently shaped pieces framing in. I would say that scribe rule is the most complicated method and there are a couple of different ways to do it. Basically, it involves stacking intersecting timbers on top of each other, using plumb bobs to drop straight lines down from the timber on top to show exactly where it intersects on the timber below, or scribing the irregular shape of the timber above onto the timber below using some sort of a scribing technique. We use the mill rule and teach the mill rule because we find that most of our customers want planed timbers. Since we're planing them, they end up square, so the mill rule is the appropriate rule to use when timber framing. If you're using rough sawn lumber, you might consider using the square rule if you find that your timbers vary tremendously. If they're within an eighth of an inch, the mill rule will work just fine for putting your timber frame together. Because milling timbers has become much more common and popular, 
we are finding that the mill rule is the most frequently used method for timber framing. So there are a couple of things to consider when you're ordering your timbers if you're planning on using the mill rule. If you have a variety of mills that you can use, it's worth asking how they plane the timbers. The best thing is a four-sided planer because it is the easiest way to get perfectly square timbers. If the mill has a one-sided planer, that means it will pass the timber through and plane one side, roll it and pass it through again, the timber will only be as square as the table is relative to the cutter knife. And that can be quite a ways off. So you might end up with timbers that are not very square, which can complicate the mill rule timber framing method. So if you have the choice between a one-sided or two-sided planer versus a four-sided planer, I would definitely recommend going with a four-sided planer. You will get squarer timbers. If you're not getting plain timbers, again, it's worth asking your supplier how square the timbers will be. Generally, we find that band sawn timbers can have more variation than radially sawn or circular sawn timbers. The blade in a circular saw mill tends to deflect less than the blade in a band saw. So you might end up with timbers that are a little less square that way, but it's always worth asking. Anyone that is a reputable supplier will be able to accurately tell you how square their stuff is, and then you can make a decision based on that. Many of you are probably planning on milling your own timber, so there are a couple things to keep in mind there. The first thing is that a sharp blade will always tend to give you straight lines in the timber. As the blade gets duller, it has a harder time going through the wood, and obviously you're pushing the cutting head, and that bandsaw will tend to deviate from a straight line as it dulls. So, while it might be painful to change the blade and keep buying blades or sharpening them, it's really worth it because it will make your cutting experience much more pleasant. The other thing is to just constantly check your setup to make sure that the carriage is flat relative to the bandsaw blade. Make sure you're not getting out of square as you're sawing. Again, a little bit of time spent in setup will save you a lot of time when it comes to cutting the joinery. The other thing you might consider doing is planing your own timber. We have had plenty of customers in the past who saw their own timber and then buy a power plane that you walk down the timber like Makita's AP12, their 12 inch planer. That allows you to get a nice smooth surface. The advantage to that is multifold. One, it's much easier to do your layout on a planed timber. It's also easier to accurately cut a planed timber. And lastly, once the building is up, it's much easier to keep planed timbers clean. Rough sawn stuff tends to grab and collect dust, whereas the, the plain timbers don't tend to, and they're much easier to clean when the time comes. But if you're planning on planing your own timbers, again, you want to pay close attention to maintaining squareness. So as you're walking the timber down, it's worth checking periodically down the length of the timber with a framing square to make sure that the surface you're creating with a planer is perpendicular to the two sides of the timber. That thing can be tilted one way or the other. So if you're out of square, it's not an exact science, you can bring it back into square. But certainly the best thing is to start with a timber that is sawn square, and that goes back to a sharp blade and checking your setup regularly. So I've described three different methods for timber framing. The one that we cover extensively in the class is known as mill rule. If you end up using square rule or scribe rule, my advice is to be patient. As with anything, practicing it will make it seem more obvious and easier, and you will get better at it. So make sure that you take your time. As you get into it, as usual, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to get in touch with us.